Okay, blue typewriter, blue shirt, green watch band. There, blue typewriter, blue shirt, blue watch band. Ah. Well, good day everybody. Welcome back to the channel. So if you have a collection of typewriters, there may be a couple of machines in your collection you've kind of just ignored for no particular reason. Maybe they're fine, they're perfectly adequate, they're perfectly usable, but you just kind of leave them be and not really use them. And in my case, not really mention them very often, but here is one example. I got this uh, typewriter in November, actually October of 2014. I paid $16.05, including tax. It is a Smith Corona SCM Galaxy 12, made in 1973. Well, the story about this typewriter was I went to this thrift store late in the morning that day and found it, excited about it, bought it, and was so excited to test it out that I drove over to a neighborhood park in southeast Albuquerque, and then I started rummaging around in my truck to find a piece of paper that I might use to type on, and it turns out the only thing I could find was this CD storage slip cover, this piece of paper, and that's exactly what I used to type on with it to test it. I dropped the tailgate in my truck, set this typewriter up on the tailgate, and I wrote, purchase for $15 from Indoor Flea Market on Central near San Pedro. Came with a case, ribbon needed rethreading onto the vibrator. Otherwise, this machine works pretty good. It probably just needs cleaning and lubing. Amazing condition for the price. I'm stoked. It is a great machine, but it's heavy and big, and at the time, I was starting to amass a pretty sizable collection of typewriters, and because of its size and weight, I ended up storing it out in the garage underneath my workbench, along with its uh, cousin, the uh, Coronet Automatic 12 electric version, which is even bigger and heavier. This typewriter, though, has served admirably with nary a hiccup of any kind of problems. It has only had a cursory cleaning of the segment, a new ribbon. I generally use this machine for public typewriter gatherings when I need a typewriter that I know is going to work fine, rugged, dependable, not easy to break for the public to use. That's what I've been using this machine for. So I haven't really been using it much for my own uses, but yesterday afternoon or yesterday morning while I was waiting around for the window guy to come by to give us an estimate on replacement windows, I had this dead time waiting for him. I was out in the garage and I decided, oh, let's take a look at that machine. And before you knew it, I was deep into this thing. Um, so one of the things about these typewriters, they're Heritage is the 5 Series uh, from the 1950s, which were one of the best typewriters ever built. But the thing about this typewriter is it's a lot more difficult to take apart. And part of the problem has to do really with this articulating ribbon cover. And there is a set of guide tracks on either side of the machine in there that those articulating joints ride on. And that whole mechanism is difficult to remove. The whole typewriter chassis is, is kind of difficult to take out. You have to, there's a certain order you have to do things in. Having said that, once you do take the chassis out of the body, you'll find it's actually surprisingly smaller than it looks. Of course, this is the wide carriage 12 inch carriage, hence the name Galaxy 12. If this was a standard width carriage outside the body, it's actually fairly diminutive. It's almost the same size as the 5 Series from the 1950s, right? It is slightly less appealing to me than that uh, 1950s version. I guess some of the reasons have to do with this is a Pica typeface, so I prefer more the smaller size typefaces for my personal kind of writings. Uh, secondly, big and heavy. 12-inch carriage. I don't really need a 12-inch carriage. And to be honest with you, I'm not really sure what actual kind of work was commonly done on 12-inch carriages. Spreadsheets? I mean, what was the purpose for putting a letter-sized sheet of paper in sideways? 
spreadsheets maybe or something like that accounting book work maybe that was the only purpose i could imagine but 12 inch carriage the smith coronas of this era didn't have the half spacing feature so one press of the key or space bar is one movement, one full space movement of the carriage. And the line spacing is one, two, or three. There's no half spacing, so you can't do one and a half, for instance, which is my favorite line spacing. So a few of those things make it less than ideal for me, but it mainly has to do with the weight and size. When the typewriter sits in its case, this little notch on the back of the typewriter should engage around this tang in the back of the case. And then to lock the typewriter into the case on the front, you push this little lever down. Now the typewriter is locked. To get the typewriter out of the case, you push it up. And now you can pull the typewriter up and out of, out of the case. This little locking device fools a lot of people if they're unfamiliar with these six series typewriter cases. I've always liked these metallic stickers that are in the backs of these machines in the case. Made with care, packed with pride. Five year parts guarantee. Smith Corona SCM made in the USA. Ah, if only that was still true. So on the upper left you have your touch adjustment and this is just a continuous adjustment. All it does is uh, adjust the preloading of a spring on the universal bar which in turn affects how hard the keys are to press. Up on the top here you have the tab is this big bar that's roughly the same size, almost the same size as the space bar. That's your tabulator, then you have the set and the clear. And on the upper right of course is your bichrome setting, black, stencil, and red. And in the bottom here, you have the um, space bar and the power space feature, which is a cool feature of the Smith Corona here that the 5 Series didn't have. Standard, more 1960s or 70s American style keyboard. Of course, Smith Corona has the uh, backspace on the left, the margin release on the right, which is M-R. Uh, you have specifically a key de-jammer right here, a dedicated key de-jammer. Now some typewriters use the margin release as the key de-jammer also, but they have a dedicated key for that. And also they have these quick replaceable keycaps and type slugs. You could collect a whole set of these special symbols and the type slugs, the two end type slugs on the segment, you could replace the slug and the keycap of course for that. So a standard American style keyboard for 1960s and 70s. And what's most notable about the ribbon cover on this model is the articulating nature of it. It's like an early 1970s American-made car. Big metal hood or bonnet or boot. It articulates out and it makes kind of a metallic sound. It doesn't have quite the finesse of a, an Olympia or a Hermes maybe, but that's just the way these were built. Gives you access to the, of course, the ribbons and the segment area, but uh, it's really difficult to remove this mechanism if you want to get the whole body panels off and get the chassis out for servicing. Okay, on the left side of the platen, you have a nice, long, shapely carriage return lever. You have your left platen knob. This button in the middle, of course, is the clutch release for the line space variable, and this is the permanent adjustment for it. This little lever right here is the temporary release of the line spacing ratchet. If you set it back, it, you'll restore your original line spacing. Um, these Smith Coronas have one, two, and three line spacing, so in one line spacing, it's a single click of the ratchet and then you have right here is your typical Smith Corona end of page detector this little roller on the end of the platen with the numbering system so if you're used to using that it's handy I don't ever really use it because it's kind of kludgy in my view down here on the front below the platen is a paper scale that corresponds to the paper scale up here and behind the platen, behind the erasing table. And you have a paper guide along here and of course the press and slide margin settings. The front scale, the paper scale below the platen here, the two mounting screws, there is a slot for those mounting screws right there which means you can adjust the side to side 
position of this scale to precisely match it to the back scale and to your actual printing position. And I kind of appreciate that. It gives the uh, service technician opportunity to, to really align the letters well with the guide. And speaking of guides, no, it's not the widest card guide of any typewriter, but these two sets of red lines on this machine, it, it aligns to the type of position very accurately. So this is really very practical for lining up your print position. A lot of machines it's just a mere suggestion, but this is pretty accurate. And of course it has the holes for using a pen or pencil to draw horizontal and vertical lines. One interesting thing about the 6 series here, as distinct from the 5 series, is inserting the ribbon when you're changing it. There is a spring-loaded little finger here with a with a tab that kind of bends forward on the tip and you just kind of stretch the ribbon tightly between your two hands and slip it down in this little gap in here. Not quite as easy as a royal, however. This one in particular, the right hand one, is a little tight. And I might also bring your attention to the jeweled escapement. This is a little jewel, synthetic jewel they put in here as an advertising slogan with a little crown in, engraved in there. That's pretty funny. Behind the platen knob, you have typically Smith Corona, very nice, shapely, and uh, ergonomic, big carriage release levers. And you know, I wonder, uh, a lot of these typewriters from this era had this, what I call, rabbit ear style of paper support. And if you're too young to remember what rabbit ears were, dipole antennas for receiving television. And they s typically sat on top of your television set. That's what it reminds me of. And I do wonder, the time period that this typewriter was marketed in, if that was the intention, to make it look like a set of dipole and rabbit ear antennas. So we have a nice hefty paper bale with a nice big finger on the right side and two rubber coated rollers that you can slide around pretty easily. So this lever here is the paper release. It releases the pressure rollers to enable you to move the paper easily. Here is your right uh, carriage release lever. Again, nice and shapely and ergonomic. Nice big platen knob. This lever here is the carriage centering for putting it in the case. And I hesitate to call this a carriage lock because it's not really a lock. It just centers it uh, uh, so the knobs are centered in the case. If the typewriter takes a big jolt and moves the carriage this way, then the escapement is now holding the carriage in place. And if it gets another hit from the other side, it could break the escapement uh, teeth, the uh, star wheel teeth. So again, not really a secure, as secure of a lock as some other uh, typewriter brands had. But one thing that's really interesting about this, of course, is it has this raised up... Uh, cover on the right side it says RP and I believe that means remove platen and this just flips up like that and you flip up your paper bale push that slide that out of the way and there you go the user can remove the platen roller themselves and you can clean behind it behind the uh, card guide clean the pressure rollers and all your erasing crumbs in the uh, area down there then put it back together like that pretty quickly, good as new. So here's one of the weaknesses of this design. As heavy and as solid of a machine it is, this is a glaring weakness, and that is the whole spindle mechanism for the ribbons is a plastic piece. The, the little disc that rotates and the little pin that engages the holes in the bottom of your ribbon spool, but th these fingers right here, these little press and squeeze fingers designed to hold the spool in place, yeah, you can tell one of the fingers is already broken off, and that's true on both ribbon uh, spools. So this is a glaring weakness in this design. They went to these plastic mechanisms, and everything else is pretty metallic and solid in this machine. It's just kind of a glaring change that they did from the 5 Series. And of course, I'm always amused by the sound that this ribbon cover makes. It slams shut with authority you know you've closed it. And of course it has that slight metallic ringing sound. It's not a dull thud of a high quality car door sound, <laughs> however. And here is a good example of using different style screws, not just uh, the heads, but the threads and the length of the screw, right? So when you're taking this apart, 
it would behoove you to separate each individual screw and note where they went. Be very good with your descriptions because it's easy to get these things mixed up and putting it back together is a lot more difficult when you don't know where each screw goes. And I should also mention there is a set of screws on the front bezel just to the outboard edge of each shift key that you have to take off and you kind of have to shift lock it to get access to it with your screwdriver. And again, it's a different style screw and head from the others. In general, the silver colored screws are screws that the customer might see. The black screws are screws that they generally won't see from the operating position. So this thin metallic label that has the patent numbers for the SCM, you have to break that seal in order to get this one screw that is required in order to take the whole chassis out of the body. And so that's like a, a, a tamper witness that whether or not you've broken the warranty, if you had this typewriter new and it was still under warranty. So this seal was never broken. I had to break it myself to take the thing apart. So that's a good indication of the uh, quality and reliability of this machine. Hadn't been fully serviced since 1973 when it was uh, manufactured. Well, when we flip the machine up on its rear panel, we see that the bottom of the machine has an easy to access bottom plate with some holes already cut in it for some of the key adjustments around the escapement and things like that. There are four rubber feet here that actually are pretty good, pretty grippy. And because of the weight of this machine, you don't really need a typing pad as far as to keep it from sliding around. The amount of weight of the 15 pounds, 14 pounds of this typewriter pushes on these little rectangular rubber blocks pretty nicely to give you some good grip. So these two shoulder screws on the bottom here in the back just loosen up. They're also very short and <laughs> just a couple little turns and it comes out. And then these screws come out and these ones are easy to confuse with the ones that hold the rear panel behind the platen carriage area. So again when you're taking this machine apart every set of screws is different and this is one of the things I don't like about it as far as servicing it. it. You have to make really good notes about where everything goes. And this panel just pulls off. These little loops go into the shoulder screws at the bottom. And that gives you access to your whole escapement area, which looks very similar to a 5 series typewriter escapement. So a lot of the adjustments can be hit very easily. You uh, clean and lubricate the hinge points of the uh, Type R linkages around the segment and also the uh, linkages, the pivot points up here and up here. And also you might take note of the plastic gears, this one here and this one here. This is part of the ribbon drive system. The cross shaft here, of course, is metal, but again, even this uh, worm gear is, or bevel gear, these are plastic. So that was sort of a noticeable decline in quality when they went to those. So back up in here is a crossbar that runs crosswise to these linkages. It actually supports the hinge point, but there is a black craft foam strip about a quarter inch wide that runs crosswise. Well, that's the uh, adhesive craft foam strip that I had to put in to replace the cork one that fell out. The cork was just sitting in the little opening here in these uh, linkages just floating around in there and it wasn't doing its job. And this was a real hassle to replace because every one of these linkages you have to push it out of the way to give room for that strip to go underneath it. So it was a real intricate, slow, tedious process. And here is part of that original cork strip. You can see the little marks that the uh, linkages had made. And then it had this adhesive plastic backing that had come loose. It was originally like that. So this was just lying in there and that little gap and those linkages going across, just floating around. And of course, it all came out in pieces because it was so brittle with age. So something else you might take note of in here is that there's no sound insulation on the inside of these metal panels anywhere. Uh, and the sides there isn't really, there's hardly any room for insulation in the side. You would think there would be as, as wide as that panel is, but that articulating or that sliding spring-loaded mechanism for the ribbon cover, it just takes up a lot of room in there, especially when you're trying to get it out, get the chassis out. It's a real problem. So no sound insulation at all on this metal body typewriter. Even on the bottom of the panel, there's no sound insulation. Of course, it has these access holes. So maybe in the future, I could try to add 
add a little bit of felt or whatever in there to try to dampen some of the sound. Even the uh, underneath side of the ribbon cover might uh, use some sound insulation. It goes a long ways toward making it a little rattly sounding. And when you put the bottom panel back on, these two little shoulder screws back here, they just fit in there like that. And underneath the right side of the typewriter is an access plate for the serial number. So this is a 6MLC series typewriter, dates to 1973. So this was the original ribbon that had been in the typewriter since 2014. And I can't remember if this was a replacement or if it was the one that had been in there all along. It may have been a replacement back then. But anyway, six years of sitting around and didn't really do it very good. So I've been using these... Um, what is it, LD ribbon, LD ribbons that I buy off Amazon. No sponsor of the show, of course, but these are DIN size ribbons, so the diameter of the spool is slightly larger than a standard size, and the hole in the center is a little bigger than some of the standard sizes, but uh, the big thing is these are really nicely darkly inked, and um, but they don't come with uh, any eyelets because these are compatible with Olympia. So I get a box of a dozen ribbons like this for maybe $12. So they're a little over a dollar a ribbon, and they're really pretty good. So I uh, went ahead and uh, installed one of these in the Smith Corona last night. The only thing is I had to add some eyelets. So I have this old eyelet crimper that I have bought years ago because I... I used to fly kites a lot more than I do now, and uh, I like to put little eyelets on the kite tail and, and uh, to be able to use quick disconnect fishing tackle to remove your tails. And But I'm using these little crimp-on eyelets. They come in a little kit with different colors. You just put it right in there like that and crimp it on the ribbon. But it helps to poke a hole in the ribbon first. So I use a sharp little awl or punch to kind of puncture a hole into the fabric and then I can crimp it with this tool here. And of course, the reason why you need eyelets is because the Smith Corona uses eyelets for the auto-reversing system, whereas the Olympias use tension, ribbon tension. They don't need eyelets. And after I changed the ribbon last night, yeah, it's really nice and dark now, even on this really thin uh, notebook paper. And you might notice uh, the type alignment is actually not bad. All right, let's do a little test typing, shall we? And the tab key. And the power spacer. Very nice. Well, where does this machine fall within the pantheon of the great typewriters in my collection? I would say it's up there. It's not on the top tier. You know, it's not quite as smooth of a touch as a Hermes 3000. It's not as crisp, maybe, as a Olympia SM series. Um, it's a little rattly and tinny, metallic sounding. It kind of reminds me of the American automobiles made in the early 1970s. Uh, but having said that, it's just a reliable typewriter. Heavy, big desktop typewriter. Not the biggest, not the heaviest, but certainly less portable than the predecessor, the 5 Series. You can certainly say that. So not the perfect typewriter by any means, but for my purposes, uh, knowing that I also have been engaged in public typewriter gatherings, which we have not really been doing this year, by the way, and parenthetically, our autumn uh, public typewriter gathering that we normally hold at Penny Smith's Paper here in Albuquerque, we've decided to forego that until maybe next spring. In any event, this typewriter has always played a useful purpose in public typewriter gatherings because it's just a good typewriter for the public to use. And if you're collecting typewriters and doing any kind of social outreach with typewriters, it's really helpful to have a couple machines like this in your collection, something you may not use personally every day or every week, but it's a good typewriter for typewriter evangelism. 
And speaking of typewriters that you don't use much yourself, but you would keep them and use them for public use, I have a couple Nakajima-made electronic daisy wheel machines, one branded Olympia, one branded Sears. I don't use them that often. They're big. They take up a lot of room on the desk. They're kind of noisy. The solenoid that hits the, the print wheel is really loud. Clack, 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 clack. So don't use them much myself, but those are good typewriters also because... The average person walking in to a public typewriter gathering off the street can easily get on using those with no fuss. So it's kind of handy at times to have that kind of a typewriter in your collection if you plan on doing any kind of outreach. And you might want to think about that because a lot of us typewriter collectors tend to focus only on collecting machines that we personally enjoy using. Like, imagine, I know there's a number of collectors that focus on Groma Calibris, right? And you might spend a lot of money and time and get a couple dozen Groma Calibris if you work at it, but do you really want the public using your Groma Calibri collection in a public typewriter gathering, or would you rather have them using more of a rugged machine like this. And that's the good thing to have a few of these around. They're very useful. Having said that, it's also blue colored. And did you notice that my watch band also matches the whole ensemble here? So there you go. Well, this is Joe. I encourage you guys, stay creative and stay well and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.